We're going to continue on in John chapter 16. We have been going through the gospel of John when we've been looking at this period between uh, the Lord's Supper and uh, going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus has been pouring a lot of information into them during this, this, this whole time. Uh, a few weeks back, we, we saw where he's saying, I'm going to leave. You need to be like me. I'm going to leave. Now you need to love like I love. Basically, you're going to become my substitute. You're going to do it by the power of the Spirit within you. And, and basically gave us our, our great commands that we are to be like him. We're to let this happen, the transformation to go on. Then he said, if you're going to look like me, last week we talked about, he said, you're going to be persecuted. The world doesn't love me. How many of you know, the more you look like Jesus, the more the world doesn't understand. And we usually persecute that which we don't understand. Uh, we, we don't know why you don't want to do everything like us. We don't know why you don't want to go along with the system. We don't know why suddenly you have changed out of the system. And he said, you're going to be persecuted. So we saw that last week. This week, we pick it up in, in John chapter 16, verse 5. And he begins with this. But now I go away to him who sent me, talking about his father. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, John's gospel, we talked about it, about 95% of John's gospel is always new information. This is no different. Matter of fact, in one of the other gospels, when it, when it says they've, they've gotten to the, the place of the garden... And he asked them to, uh, you know, pray with me and all that. He's going to be praying. One, it says in the old King James, you know, that they wept themselves sore. They, they had been weeping. And it's a good reason that they fell asleep. Because, you know, to weep yourself sore is like I can't cry anymore. And, and you think about here's these big, strong men, fishermen and and all this, yet, yet they're weeping. Why are they weeping? Well, if you spent your life with three and a half, half years with somebody, and they weren't just somebody, they were the son of God. They weren't just somebody, they walked on water. They, they fed 5,000. They, they did all these things, healed people, loved on people. They were just blown away and amazed over and over. And you think you're going there to take the kingdom... And now after the Lord's Supper, he keeps talking about leaving. And they're shocked. He said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to my father, but you're not asking me where I'm going. And, and your heart is filled with sorrow. Well, everything's changing. What, what's going on? Don't you remember, Jesus? We were arguing at the Lord's Supper who was the greatest because we want to know who's vice president and secretary of state and treasurer. You know, we, we got to take these governmental positions and we got to find out who's greatest among us of your 12. And now you're talking about leaving. What, what is going on? I'm paraphrasing for them because basically they were shell shocked. They were, they were listening. They weren't asking because they're trying to absorb. What are you saying? And he's saying all these things. You got to become like me and you're going to be persecuted. And they're trying to compute. Matter of fact, they're going to need the Holy Spirit to remind them what he said. They're going to have to, in a sense, recover from their shock that he's leaving. And, and they're filled up with, with anguish. And by the time they're going to get to the garden, they're going to be played out with this kind of, well, I don't know, we're just bawling, we're just weeping with one another. Uh, and we're going to fall asleep in the garden. And look what he says. You're not asking me where I'm going, but because I've said this, you're... You're filled with sorrow in your heart. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. You need to hear this. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage or benefit that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The helper is the Holy Spirit. Now he says, it's to your advantage I go away. It's to your benefit. Let me tell you, how is Jesus going to go away? Death, that's right, death on the cross. He's going to go away by the cross. So the cross is necessary. 
One, why? Because we have sins and, and we can't do it. And he says, if I go away, then I will be able to send the helper to you. Well, where's the helper right now? It's in Jesus. That's right. It's in Jesus. And here's the problem. That's the only one the helper's in. He's by himself. Except to see die, it can't produce more like it. And so Jesus has to go away, and he's going to go away by death. And when he goes away by death, he will do something that we could not do, pay for our sins and, and still live. He will die for our sins, and then our sin problem is done. How many are you glad your sin problem's done? And you may say, well, pastor, I'm still dealing with sin. Yeah, but you're not dealing with somebody paying for those sins. See, you may still be battling some, and you may still be learning how to walk with God, so it, but sin has been dealt with. When we mess up, we don't need another Savior to come, do we? No, that one Savior took care of sin. So he says, I have to go. I have to go, because if I don't go, the helper can't come, and the helper can't come if you have not had your sins dealt with. So he goes to the cross. He takes that body that could die. It's been protected all this time. He took that body, let it go to the cross, and it died. And our sins were paid for, all of our sins, everything. Anything we would ever do when it came to that sin category was dealt with. Now, that's not good enough either. Because now our sins are dealt with, but I still can't get myself into heaven. See, the opportunity is coming close, but I, you know, Jesus died for my sin. But I could go to, G, go to, to the Father and say, Father, let me in now because Jesus died for my sin. That's, that's not the answer. I have to have a vehicle to get to heaven. Now we need a resurrection. Come on, are you getting this? You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he became savior of the world. He died for their sins. For I will save my people from their sins. But now he has to resurrect and become something new. He resurrects in a body that can't die. The Bible says he was the firstborn of many more to come. He was the first of a new creation. The resurrected man that can't die. And now if I will believe in him, that becomes my access to heaven. Are you getting this? I come in by faith in the new man, the resurrected one. You see, that's why when people say they want a savior, you can't just have a savior. The whole world's got a savior and, and most of the world doesn't believe in him. What is it you have to have to get to heaven? You have to have not only the Savior, you have to have the Lord. The Lord is the resurrected one who was given a name above every name that every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? Lord changes everything. It's the resurrected Lord, the Savior, who now we honor, we have faith in, and that is how I get access to heaven. And we're going to see that, but it was necessary for Jesus to leave and, and not be a part of, of what they were doing. You see, if you and I, without the Spirit helping us, we would say something like this. It hey, wouldn't it be awesome to have Jesus right here? just standing right here with us and, and walking in this life. with well, The problem would be if we had that, just like the disciples had it, our sins wouldn't be dealt with. He had his life. It was back there 2,000 years ago. And he lived his life in honor to God on this earth, in this realm. And then he gave that life to the cross and our sins were paid for. Then the resurrected Jesus, the firstborn of a new creation, the one that can die, is now waiting for us to believe, to trust in him, so that when we die, we're resurrected with the same type of new body. And we join in him, like him, for a future that never ends. And that's the picture. 
Uh, it is not that we have a Jesus here who is showing us everything. No, Jesus says the spirit who's helping me know everything needs to get into you. And when he's into you, you're going to perceive what you don't know. You see, for three and a half years, they walk with Jesus and now they're crying on the way to the garden because they didn't know anything. How many remember the day when you found out you don't know anything? <laughs> How many remember that day? How many are amazed as the Spirit keeps on teaching you that you keep finding out you didn't know? And he blows away your traditions and he blows away your thoughts and images of God and what you thought about Jesus and what you thought about the Father and what you thought about the Holy Spirit and what you thought about this life itself. And the Spirit blows your mind because he is your teacher. He is revealing to you what? All truth and taking you farther down. And Jesus said, I have to go so that this can happen to you. Because without it, we don't grow. Without it, we're not changed. Without it, we don't get access. And so Jesus has to depart. Let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the... In other words, he's gone. He departed. But it's good for us that he departed. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now that we know he did it, now that we know he, we, he has his spot, let us not waver from the faith. Let's hold fast our confession that he is our Lord, our Savior. Let's hang on to that because he's in position to do exactly what he was purposed to do. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In other words, he's been where you are and he is a victor, so walk with him so you can become a victor. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So now I didn't have access, but because he departed, I now have access and by faith I can come boldly to the throne and ask. Why? Because I'm connected with him. I didn't deserve it down here, but, but he earned it. And so through him in his name, I don't come there and say, hey, I'm, I'm to the throne here as Rick Betts. No, I come... In the name of Jesus, the one who earned it, the one who deserves it. I didn't, but by believing in him, I now have access to what I did not have access and would not have without him. Come on, church, you getting this? So he had to depart so this could happen. Uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 16. And I, pr I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you. How long? So once the Holy Spirit comes, the purpose is to take you all the way home, to follow after him, to be changed, to be conformed. The, the plan of God is that the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the Lord cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Well, how did they know him? For he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus is saying you knew him because he was in here. Everything I've been doing has been empowered by the Spirit. So you've been touched, you've seen, you've gotten information from, and it was all by the Spirit in here. But if I depart, he'll be in you. Future, he will be in you after my death and resurrection, and I send it forth. You see, the Father sent forth the Spirit to the Son because he earned it. But the Son, by grace and favor on us that didn't, he gives us the Holy Spirit. So we can do what we could not do, what we did not deserve because he earned it. But in loving him, in faith with him, we now get something we did not deserve. But you can't, you can't remove faith in him, believing him. You got to believe in him to get that which you did not uh, deserve, the Holy Spirit. Then verse 8, John 16, verse 8. Uh, for when he has come, he will convict the, talking about the Holy Spirit, when the helper comes, when, when the, the one comes to help. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to convict. And, and in that word, it's, it's, it means two things, to convict and to convince to convict and to convince. In other words, the Holy Spirit will, will come and bring you to the place of seeing or understanding. And then you'll be held account for what you know. Take, take Saul, who was Paul. He was persecuting the church, but he was seeing people love him, pray for him. And the Spirit was working on Saul 
to convict him that what he was doing was wrong. Correct? So that the spirit was doing his job to convict and to convince. Well, he was convicting Saul that this wasn't the right thing. And on that day on the road to Damascus, when he dropped him to his knees with that bright light from the sky and he struck blind. You know, Saul's like, what, what's going on here? And a voice says, Saul, isn't it hard for you to kick against the brick? The goad. Well, who's goading him? The Holy Spirit, right? Convicting him that what he's doing is not really serving God. He thought he was serving God. And God's been saying, you're not serving me. It's not the truth. They have something you need. So he's being convicted. And then he says, who are you, Lord? And this voice from heaven says, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Let me tell you, from that point on, he was convinced. You understand? The spirit brings you to conviction and to convincing. From that point on, he's accountable for what he knows. And then he was given instructions. You go here. And they took him and he stayed there. And while he was blind, the spirit spoke to him and told him things he was supposed to be knowing that suddenly his whole world turned upside down was beginning to acknowledge all by the spirit coming and convicting him and Ananias came and and laid hands on him and and the world has changed upside down for the spirit comes to convict and to convince he's come to convict you to show you that Jesus is your answer too. see we didn't ask for a savior God so loved the world that he gave us a savior we didn't ask for a Lord. God so loved the world, he gave us a Lord. Now we have access to heaven. Why? Because the Father loved us. He loved us the only way he could. He was holy, we were not. So he couldn't send his love to us directly. How did he do it? He did it through his son. And now if you'll love the son, the Father will love you. If you'll love the son, you'll have access to all that the Father has because the Father planned it that way. So hopefully here today, if somebody has not surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior, there's a spirit convicting you right now, the Holy Spirit, letting you understand your position and then convincing your heart so that you will surrender and the, the miracle begins, the incredible thing begins. Let's look at that a little bit. John chapter 8, verse 23. And he said to them, talking to the Pharisees, which were very religious people, but they did not honor God. They did religious stuff and they had religious robes, but their heart was opposed to God. They thought they were serving in religion, but they were moving away from God in relationship. And Jesus said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. Well, Pastor Rick, you just said that Jesus came to the cross and died for all the sins, every sin in the world. I did, yes. Well, then how are they going to die in their sins? Watch. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. Why? For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. See, sins have been dealt with. He's the Savior. They have to believe in him. They have to believe because heaven won't be theirs and they will die in sins. Meaning what? Sin took them out? No. The only sin that took them out was not believing in Jesus. That's the sin that took them out. They didn't believe in Jesus. Well, what about them dying in their sins? Because that's where they chose to live. You see, when the spirit of God comes in, here's what he begins to tell you. Now come out of your sins and move into my ways, righteousness. He says, come out of where you were and move into where you're going to be. Now, if I choose, well, I hear that, but I don't love you enough to leave my location of living. I'm not going to go to your practice field of righteousness. I enjoy, even though you convicted me, I enjoy being on the practice field of darkness. So I'm going to stay there. Well, see, if you do that, and you reject him as Lord and Savior, guess where you will die? You will die surrounded by that which you loved. You will die in the sins that you loved more than the righteousness that you didn't love. You see, on Judgment Day, he will not say, you can't come in because of a liar, stealing, sexual uh, uh, issues, and, and you know everything else. 
He won't do that. All that was paid for on the cross. What will he do? Depart, for, I don't know you. Depart from me, you who loved darkness more than light. See, if you love where you're at, then you won't love Christ to move to a new location. You understand? So therefore, sins, the sins do not take you out because Jesus died for those sins. That's not your problem. Anybody that came here today, your sin's not your problem. I don't care how bad you think you are. Jesus was, was greater than your sin. He paid for them on the cross. Your problem is if you do not believe on him as Lord and Savior. That's your problem. That's your sin. When God, the Holy Spirit, opens up your eyes to that and you still reject it, that's your sin. There is no other sin. You know, why is it you can come against the Jesus, you can come against the Father, but if the Holy Spirit convicts you and convinces you and you reject that, why is it that's the unforgivable sin? Because he's convicting you and convincing you that Jesus is Lord. And if you reject that, there is no hope from that one. You understand? That's why that's the unforgivable sin, because that is not going with the conviction and the convincing that the Holy Spirit does. And, and, and he can't solve that one because the Spirit comes to offer you your future. And if you reject your future, there is no hope. You know, we all know the word says that, that God desires that all would be saved. God desires that all would come into repentance. So there's only one place that he purposed and planned for you, and that is your future with him. That's it. If you won't go with the future that he planned for you, then you get another future that the Bible says is this. Depart from me, you who love darkness more than light. Well, where are they going to? To the place that was prepared for people? For the devil and his angels. Well, if hell was not prepared for, the, for people, then what was prepared for people? Heaven. God desires for everybody to get there. God desires it. He gave a Savior to the world. He gave a Lord to the world because he desires us all to be there. What a tragedy. What a tragedy when people miss what God purposed for them. And they, they choose out of their love for their old position to go to a place that was never prepared for us. Amen? Hope you can see that. All right. Then uh, 1 John. This is a wonderful thing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you may say, okay, pastor, there we're dealing with sins again that he paid for. And, and, and you said they're taken care of, but there it is again. We're confessing our sin. Well, look, here's the problem. Who are we confessing them to? To Jesus. He is the one who then has to be faithful and, and, and receive us back and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, here's the deal. He died for our sins. He was risen as Lord. Now we need to be committed to him. Totally, totally faithful. So what happens when we go, Jesus, we understand that you're the bridegroom. We're the bride. We need to be faithful, but I'm going to go away and I'm going to do my own thing. Well, at that moment, what are we being? We're being unfaithful, correct? Now, here's the marvelous thing. In this life, in this realm, usually if somebody is engaged to somebody else and then they become unfaithful, usually what happens? It dissolves. It dissolves, right? Well, here's the amazing thing. The purpose of the Father is that everybody would be saved. So the bridegroom doesn't dissolve anything if somebody will come back. You understand? So when you go off and become unfaithful, if you will do true repentance, true repentance, which is you turn from that and say, you know what? What am I doing here? I, this is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to live in my sin. I'm going to go back to my bridegroom. And you confess and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I did this. I walked away. He will be faithful and just and say, come on in. You did it against me, but I'm, I'm for the Father's plan. We're going to bring everybody that will come. And he has a full heart to receive you back as if you had never left. Full forgiveness of sin. Come on, church, are you getting that? That's who he is. So 
the sin, again, was not that we lied, not that we stole, not that we did sexual adultery or anything like that. The sin was that we left the one we said we believed in. And when we come back to him, he's faithful to receive us back, at, you know, and, and put us back to that same place that we were when we left. See, the sins don't take you out. It's unbelief in Jesus that takes you out. The sins aren't the problem. It's his lack of lordship in your life that's the problem. All right, and then go on down to uh, 2. 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you what? That's right. The, the, the Bible's written so we will get out of sin, not get back in it. It's so you won't sin. And if anyone sins, you, you know people are going to miss it. So there's provision for that too. And what is the provision? It's Jesus himself. He'll be your advocate. You see, if sins, was, if sins were it alone, then wow, we went back and sinned. Now we're lost. See, that's where people go in that I'm saved, I'm lost, I'm saved, I'm lost, I'm saved. I'm like, Listen, sins aren't knocking you in and out of heaven. Rejection of Jesus is your issue. You know, that's why if you find yourself in unfaithfulness, he's still standing there as your bridegroom. You knew this, come on back. He, you knew this, come on back. When's it, when, when are you going to miss it? When you die out there. Because if you die out there, you've died in your sins. The prodigal was okay on the father's property. He was lost off the... Meaning if he died out there, he was in trouble. He, if he'd have died unconnected to the father... Where are we supposed to be? Connected to Jesus. You know, people said, but pastor, you should be preaching about eternal security. I am. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you, nobody is afraid when they're locked in with Jesus. When do they get afraid? When they become unfaithful to Jesus and then they want eternal security. Let me play in my darkness and give me eternal security. No, the eternal security is not an act or a prayer. It's a person. His name is Jesus. He is our justification, nothing else. He, your prayer to receive him the first time is not your justification. It is Jesus himself who is your justification. Do you understand that, church? Do you understand that? Okay. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the substitution for our sins. He paid the price. That makes him Savior. And not for ours only, but for the, also of the whole world, for the sins of the whole world. See, so he's paid for the Christians, but he's also paid for everybody, whether they believed or not. You see, everybody has a Savior. Uh, you know, so... People that say, well, I had a Savior, I just didn't have a Lord. Well, I'm glad you finally got saved because you got to have a Lord to be saved. Without a Lord, you don't get access to heaven. Without loving and, and walking with and being conformed to, uh, you got to have that for salvation. And uh, then the, the next one, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 20, for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, in other words, he was a perfect person, to be sin for us on the cross. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God. It doesn't make it automatic. It means now you have your opportunity. The death and resurrection of Jesus is your opportunity. It doesn't make it automatic. Uh, that's the love of God. You have to love him back. And then uh, Romans 4, chapter uh, verse 20. Uh, but he, talking about Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that that which he had promised, he was also able to perform. He had promised that you're going to have a child, and through that child, the whole world's going to be blessed. And, and therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he believed God in the Old Testament in his relationship with God. And because of that, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, wait a minute. That's the Old Testament. Jesus hasn't even come yet. Well, let me tell you, faith in God would work backwards in the Old Testament. They believe that God would be Savior. We believe that God is Savior. And it works both ways. Faith then in God is where sin is not the issue. Faith is. 
You see, back then, if you would believe what God said, believing he would be your savior, he had an answer, a Messiah, then faith uh, eliminated the sin problem. In the same way here, we now look back to the Savior, the one who had died. And when we have faith in him, it also eliminates the sin problem. Now it's all about faith. For the just, those that are going to have access to heaven, live by what? Faith. Because nobody's justified in themselves. Not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. We are justified by faith. In the Messiah, justified by faith in our Savior, justified by faith in our Lord. Come on, church, you're grabbing hold of this. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be in, imputed to us who believe in him who was raised up, Jesus. Meaning, what worked back then works today, only now through the vehicle of understanding who Jesus is who was raised up, uh, raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses. And so see, why did he have to become Savior? To die for our sins, for our offenses. That's when he became Savior. And was raised, that's when he became Lord, because of our justification. You see, without him being raised from the dead, there's no justification for me to get in the house. He died for my sin, but I still can't get access to the house of God. So unless he's raised again and is Lord and I can get attached to the Lord of the house, then I can't get in the house. So what's my justification of coming to the house that I'm connected to the Lord? That's why, uh, uh, you, know, if, you know, just take it today. We understand it today. If somebody marries a son or daughter of the house, they get connected to the house, don't they? Right? Suddenly, you got a new son. You got a new daughter. That's what we say, right? Hey, got a new daughter. Got a new son. Why? What happened? Marriage. Outside of marriage, they're not your son or daughter, are they? See, when we get attached to the Lord, that justifies why we're at the house. That's why we get a new name. That's why we get part of the throne. That's why we get part of the scepter. That's why we get to live in the house. Because we are justified by Jesus. I, I can be here because I love the Son of God. Keep going. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, by being justified, without justification, if I tried to get in the house, there'd be war, wouldn't there? Why, I'd be kicked out because I don't deserve to be there. But with connection with the Lord, then I'm justified to be there. There's peace when I enter the house. I have peace with God because I'm connected with the Lord. I'm part of the family through marriage. And so there's peace and access through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the future. So by faith, I get connected to the very power I'm going to have in the future, this grace, and I celebrate in the hope of my future wedding with God. It's, it's our glory. It's the future glory we're going to have. We're going to be in the house. And why? Because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, then uh, verse 10. The Spirit is going to convict us of righteousness. Why? Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You see, Jesus was there to tell them what was right. If they had a question, they said, Jesus, what about this or what about... And Jesus would tell them. The Spirit was in him and he could give an answer. Well, now Jesus is going to leave. But the Spirit that's in him is going to come into us and now the Spirit will tell us what's right and what's wrong. The Spirit will convict us of the things that are God's and the things that aren't of God's. You see, people look in the Bible and they're trying to figure out some of our problems we have in today. You know, well, what's the answers for this? And you're not going to be able to go to the Bible and everything be explained exactly there. But the same Spirit of the Bible is the same Spirit we have today. And He will tell you what's right and wrong about our modern day situations. And we will be able to understand, be convicted and convinced by the Spirit of God in us. We don't have Jesus to go to and ask that question here on the earth. We have to get it by the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit will lead you into all truth. 
And you may say, yeah, but there's a whole, all kinds of different things out there. Well, yes, there are, because all of us are being conformed and having to be changed. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you get it right. How many know that you've been fine-tuned? Yeah, and, 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 and it never stops. I, you know, I, I got saved at 13, I'm 60 now, and he's still fine-tuning. He's still trying to draw me in. He's still trying to give me more. Under what on earth can you do that long ago and it's still better today? It's still working. It's still got energy. It's still that because that's what Christ does in us. Now, if you have lost it, it is because you have, watch. Remember when, when, when David went off and he said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. See, what are we supposed to have? We, we came in here to celebrate and to do, to have a joy about what? Of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in that love that he continues to fine tune us. If we start losing and we're not changing to conform, it's because we have fallen out of love. What did the spirit say to the, the church in, in the letter when he said, return to your first love, return to your love because it's in love that you are changed. And when you stop loving, you stop being changed. And this Christian life becomes boring to you. And it's like all that. And then you're more tempted to say, let's get some excitement in my life. And you go back to the things of your past. Let me tell you, there is just enough fine excitement here if you're loving on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will love him, I'm telling you, there is so much excitement, it's hard to contain sometimes. But if we don't pursue God and we just take the world and the world is our place to find pleasure and joy and all that, it's no wonder that, that the church is, is an empty tank for you. You see, this is not supposed to be a, an empty tank. Walking with God is to be a joy and it's to continue to be a joy. And the more he conforms, the more we know him, the more we follow after him, the greater it gets. And I'm telling you, you ought to have an anticipation of what God's going to do. You should wake up every day and just get say, okay, Lord, we are a divine appointment going somewhere to happen. I'm serious. This is a God moment just waiting to happen somewhere. We ought to have that excitement. But, but a lot of us don't, and it's a love problem. That's what it is. Don't fall out of love with the only thing you're supposed to love, which is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so to understand that, let's go to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Now, remember we said grace has a name, and it's the Spirit, the Spirit of grace. Love has a name, the Spirit of love. The Holy Spirit is, are these forces that we get to see. Well, here's a neat thing, because the Spirit also has a name, which is Lord. The Spirit is the Lord without the physical body. The Spirit is revealing to us who Jesus is. It didn't come to talk about the Spirit. It came to talk about Jesus because it is the, the, the Lord is the, is the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit is here to do one thing, reveal to us who our, our uh, a bridegroom is. So now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He frees us from our past. He frees us from sin. And he offers us our future. So where the spirit is, there is a liberty that comes from God. But we all, everybody who believes in him, with unveiled face, meaning uh, we don't have blinders on anymore. The blinders are off. We actually can be changed. When you, when you can actually see something, you can be changed to, to be like it. So with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Now, the glory represents something revealed. So you can't see the glory of God unless something of God is revealed. So we, we look just like looking in a mirror, we can see an image. And that image that we're seeing that God in the spirit wants to show us is the image of who Jesus was and is. And when we see it, we are convicted of what doesn't look like him in us. And we go, okay, I'm seeing what I should look like, what I should be. The spirit convicts us of what we should look like. And when I move and honor that, then I am changed into the same image. I begin to look like Jesus in that area. And hallelujah, how many of you know we all got a lot of image to change? And so it doesn't stop with one moment. One moment is just the beginning of many, 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 many more moments to come. 
we look in a mirror of the glory of the Lord being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, meaning by revelation to revelation to revelation. A lot of us take that and we say, well, that's like the Bible, you know, and we learn by re Yes, that, that is true, but it's, it's life period. Everything in God is transforming us. The more we see Jesus, the more we're transformed in every way, not just in reading the Bible, but how we do every aspect of life. He is conforming us by how? Showing us how Jesus would do it. Showing us how Jesus would do it. See, you may be in a room and a brother full of the Spirit of God may do something, and you go, that looks so much like Jesus. And then we want to imitate it because that's how Jesus would do it. And, and, and see, if you hang around bad characters, you start getting bad, don't you? Why is that? Because you're, you're being changed by the image that they are teaching you. If you've got good characters that are showing you, especially if they are full of the Spirit and being changed, well, then those good characters are constantly showing you who Jesus is, and you're being changed by the revelation. That's why we're supposed to fellowship, gang. Not so that we can get together and argue about what color the carpet's supposed to be. <laughs> That's how churches split. No, we come together because we want to love on one another and let the image of Christ change us to who he is. Amen. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. All right. Galatians chapter 5, 22. But the fruit of the spirit is, what is it? Love. You see, so when I start looking like Jesus, when the spirit, the Lord uh, that is the spirit starts coming to me, I start looking more like Jesus. And what happens? More love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many need self-control? Self-control <laughs> against such there is no law. See, that's the good things that they don't know how to, man, when you bring that into your office, they don't know what to do with you. And just get him transferred. Get him out of here. You know. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. It means we've taken on the purpose. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It's, but we've taken on the purpose of getting the old life out of here. Don't you think every new believer should hear something like this? You come to Christ, then you have decided to agree that now your purpose is to get the old life out and get the new life in. We don't, we don't hear a lot of that. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we say we're His, then let's show it that our walk lines up with it. And then the next one's uh, Ephesians chapter 5. For you were what? You were once darkness. See, you shouldn't be there anymore. You shouldn't locate yourself there anymore. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. How does that look like? For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. See, for a lot of us, man, that's not exciting. That sounds boring to us. But really, I'm telling you, you add that. Do you think reading the life of Jesus is boring? Do you, do you understand there is a battle going on? It's for the hearts and minds of people. And when you present Christ to them, the incredible happens around you. So let's let the conformity happen. Let's let the transformation happen. Let's get in on the real life, the real excitement, the real things that will last forever and let the Spirit do His work. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Can you imagine? Our walk is finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. It's not excusing us to stay where we were. It's not trying to be cool to everybody and let them like us. It is about a heart that says, what's your job today? Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. You know, if you woke up every day and say, Lord, today, help me. I'm looking, I'm paying attention. Let me find out what's acceptable to you. Do you think that would change our lives? Instead of saying, thank God for grace and excuse yourself with anything you're about ready to do. And see, I, you know, the spirit of grace is the Holy Spirit who's come to change you to look like Jesus. So why on earth would you call on grace to not be changed? If you call on grace and you're saying we're going to look at the whole day to find out what's acceptable to God. Come on, church. Are you hearing me? And and then now here, here is Paul who's called the apostle of grace. Right. Now look what Paul adds to this comment. Verse 11, and have, how much fellowship with your past? No fellowship. No fellowship with where I came out of? No, get out of it. 
Get out of your old sin nature. Don't accept it. Don't love it. Don't co you know, coddle it. Get rid of it. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Everything that you were in, come out of it. This is what the Apostle of Grace says. Well, if I can't keep it and protect it, what should I do? Expose it. You see, if you come here with a mask on, doing your sin in the darkness while you're trying to be and say you're a child of the light, uh, then, then you're missing the whole point. You should rather take the mask off and say, here's what I'm dealing with. Confess it. Let God start loving on you. Let people walk you out with that. And let them support you. Let them help you. And say, this is my issue. This is what I have to deal with. Listen, I'd rather walk arm in arm with somebody struggling with sexual sin and, 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 and whatever, their, their, their drugs, their drinking, their, and, and be able to be real and say, and then have an arm to be able to walk you out. We don't say it's okay. We say you're coming out of it, but we're going to help you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to support you. Why is it? Because I have agreed now the Lord wants me out of this. So even if it's a struggle, I'm headed the right way. Support me. If I fall, pick me up. Let, let's be a part of this. I'd rather walk with that brother, with that sister, than to have to walk with the one that constantly puts the mask on and says, yeah, I'm good, while they're doing their darkness. Come on, church, you understand? Yeah. So we don't, we don't continue in it. We begin to expose it and say, here's what I'm dealing with. And, and I know where I'm supposed to get to. And this is what's holding me back. Can you pray with me? Let's, let's, let's go. And you'll get the advice. You'll get the help. And I'm telling you, put yourself in there. I'm telling you, God will do the incredible when you do that. But let me tell you, have you seen people fall dramatically when they hide it? And then, boom, it comes out. And it's, and it's just sad when that happens. Let's just do what the word says. Confess your sins to one another. Confess it with the right people, with the right ones that will support you and help you, not those that will mock you or use it as the gossip line. Uh, confess to those that have the real spirit of Christ because they'll help you get through it. Amen. All right. And then uh, this last one, verse 11, of judgment. He's going to convict of judgment. Why? Because the ruler of this world is judged. Listen, the devil's already lost. The cross and the resurrection already ruined the devil. He's on his way to a final judgment. So now everything, every time you go opposite of Jesus, you're in his world. That's why there is therefore now no condemnation to those what? that are in Christ Jesus who what? Right there who walk not after the flesh. Well, what happens when those that know God walk in the flesh? They're playing with judgment. See, he's our, devil's already judged. When you know God and you go back to where the devil is, that's an issue because judgment is with the devil. Well, then if judgment's with the devil, then where's freedom? With Jesus. So when I come to Jesus, there's no condemnation. Yeah, but I've done all kinds of sin. Yeah, but he is that security. He's not there to condemn me. And when I fellowship with him and stay in the right place, no condemnation. When I go back to the devil, guess what? He is judgment. I'm literally with the man of judgment. Come on, church, are you getting this? So where is freedom? Here. You see, when I go off to sin, I got a problem. I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the place of judgment. The spirit convicts me I'm in the wrong place. Why is he convicting me? Come on, don't you know there's grace? No, but you're in the wrong place. But if I'll turn from being in that place and confess to Jesus, he receives me back to the good place and no condemnation. As if I'd never done that. Come on, do you understand? Here is the place of forgiveness, not out there. Here is the place of no condemnation, not out there. That's been judged. That is going to go down, and I have left Jesus to go out here. Is it any wonder, then, we should come back with tears and repent to Jesus? You know, I told you the case where a, a brother came back and was weeping because he knew he'd been in the wrong place. The Spirit convicted him and brought him back. And a dear, loving saint came up and said, oh, brother, don't cry. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And, and they were totally wrong. 
because they should have been crying because they had left their bridegroom and they should have come back with tears confessing to the Lord. And then the Lord picks them up and says, I love you, restore you right to where you are. They should have come back repenting and it should have hurt because they knew they were back in the place of judgment. But they came back to the place of no judgment. You can't mix that up, church. You can't mix that up and say, oh, good, uh, no condemnation because I believe in Jesus, so now I can go play in the darkness and everything's good. No, that's not how it works. The freedom is here. The freedom is in the Lord. The transformation happens here. This is our home. Let's finally agree with it, amen? Let's live here and rejoice and set up our tent, put up our flag and say, this is where I live. Amen? It is your future. So, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw how many? All people to myself. I'm going to deal with this sin one last time. And so when he died for the sins of the world, he also judged Satan. It was over. And so when you go back to your sins, you're in the place of the devil's judgment. We have to get that one right or, or we're going to be very confused. That is not our home anymore. That is the place of judgment. Our home is now in righteousness to learn and to grow and to discover the things of God. This he said signifying by what death he would die. It was by the cross that he permanently took care of sin and permanently judged uh, Satan, and it's no longer our home. Therefore, those who are Christ have crucified the passions and desires, meaning we have agreed that's not our home anymore. This is our home. When you get into baptism, we're going to do that here at the, the church picnic. The baptism is I agree that I die with Christ, and I agree now that when I come up out of here, I'm supposed to be living toward righteousness. I agree with a life in Christ. This is now my home. That's what baptism represents. And uh, that's what we need to have a part. And then the last one, Hebrews 2, 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, meaning he came into our condition of the human body. And that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death over us in this life, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, it's not about death anymore. It's about eternal life with him. It's not about being lost. It's about being justified to enter into eternity and live forever. So yes, will we see saints die in this physical life? Yes. Will we see people get sick and suffer and, and where there'll be things like that? Yes. But our future is not locked into this world anymore. We have a future because God came, loved us, died for us, and gave us a Lord that we could have justification to go and be with him forever for all eternity. Amen. Why don't you stand? Woo! Yeah, there was a lot there. All right. Praise God. And somebody may be here and you may say, I don't know Jesus like that. Maybe while we were talking, you got convicted and say, you know what? I, I don't know what you're talking about, pastor. I haven't surrendered my life to the Lord in that way. But right now, God's convicting me. I'm seeing it for the first time. Well, amen, brother. Amen, sister. That's what God does. He opens up your eyes. He'll give you an opportunity by faith to step in to this wonderful thing, which is Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, accepting that he died for your sins, accepting that he opened a way now for you to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit that is right here in this room, this moment, has already changed lives and is about ready to change yours if you will enter in by faith. But we can't do that for you. You have to take that step. You have to be willing to say, it's not about me anymore. He said, if you will lose your life for my sake, you will gain your life. You will have all eternity. But let me tell you, the revelation of it will start right here. You will understand what you've entered into because God will start changing your world right away. So if that's you, brother, if that's you, sister, God's done this and you know you need to say a prayer of committing your life. Then I'll lead you in that prayer. All Everybody here will say it with you. They won't leave you to do it by yourself. But you have to self-identify. You have to confess you need Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Anybody in the room that needs that, raise your hand up high. And we'll say this prayer with you today. Anybody in the room that needs that prayer, raise your hand up high. 
And we'll say this prayer with you. Right there, brother. Right there, brother. Amen. Amen. I see the brother. Anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. Come on. Don't want to miss anybody. If God's speaking to any of your heart, amen, brother. All right. I don't see any other hands. All right. We're going to say this together. All right. We're all going to say it, but you say it from your heart because God knows what's going on with you. Amen. Let's say this. Dear Lord, I thank you for today and the words I've heard. You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now and teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your very word that I can now confess by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen. <laughs> Woo, amen. To have a little celebration party there. All right, you just got a packet from our usher. Listen, that packet just has some helps to get started in this, this walk. But please take that packet right over here to the corner. We've got some people that want to pray with you. Also to invest in that decision to give you a brand new Bible if you need it. So, so family, friends, just make sure he gets over there. Okay. And uh, we just celebrate with you together. And, and brother, if you don't have a place or a church, you got one here if you want it. But we all say welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. And listen, if you're here and, and you were like, you know what? I wanted to do that, but I didn't. But we all said the prayer. And if you meant that prayer, get yourself over there. You get yourself over that corner too. I'm so grateful for the ones that said, you know what, Pastor, you never saw me raise my hand, but I, my life was changed. One day when somebody else was brave enough to raise their hand, my life was changed, and I've never been the same since. So if that's you, brother, sister, get on over to that corner. Amen. All right, church, we got seven days. Let's let the Lord transform us. Let's let the Lord lead us and guide us. Let's have that be that, those lights he's called us to be. Let's be uh, world changers because Christ is being seen in us. Amen. Let's give him honor and glory for it. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love that you sent Jesus. Thank you for your spirit that still draws people to yourself today. Thank you for this one that gave their heart to the Lord today. Lord, may you continue to conform us. Bless us, Lord, as we walk with you and that you would see more and more of your son in our lives, giving you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.